That sounds a lot like the Buddhist atomisms that Jeff is here talking about. Uh, so we have this dilemma, uh, as we'll see in a moment, because uh, the pen and the atoms that allegedly make it up, uh, have, there's some conflicts between the two. It's not clear how they both can coexist. In other words, it's not clear how the, the atoms can make up uh, the pen, how the Buddhist atoms can make up the pen. Okay. Now, our traditional picture of, whoa, here we go, traditional picture of, that we're given in uh, philosophy, so anywhere in, really in Western thought, uh, is something like this. I just made this, I couldn't find the diagram I really wanted, but I made it before, so I just whipped this out, so sorry for the crudeness. Uh, we're told that there are the basic building blocks that I've told you about, which I'm calling Buddhist atoms. So electrons, quarks, and so forth. Uh, this is leads to the overall field of physics, where physics leads to chemistry, chemistry leads to biology, and then out of biology emerge other things like economics, minds, societies, planets, galaxies, whatever you want to think. Um, sorry, and chemistry also, you know, can uh, give rise to its own. I forgot to put another arrow over there, um, where you know this can give rise to what are called middle order solids. Uh, or middle order items like a pen or a planet or so forth and so forth. That's the way philosophers refer to them. Uh, however, here's what uh, Buddhist atomism uh, does. It goes like this. It cuts that right there. That is what I mean by reductionism. Okay, these, it's not clear what the connection is from here to here. The ultimate Buddhist atomic building blocks. It's not clear how they are building blocks, how they build anything. And in fact, as we'll see, what the Buddhist does in the era that I'm going to discuss in a minute is maintains that these here are largely constructions of consciousness. And this is what really exists. Those are the ultimate and real items. So if you see reality and it looks like this, you're dreaming. But if you see reality and it looks like that, you're seeing something real. That would be the Buddhist, the picture of reality according to Buddhist atomism. Okay, so now to understand all this, so that, that's basically a quick and easy way to describe reductionism. So it's important to understand though that in Buddhist philosophy that I'm referring to, we do have, we can consider reality as having two, we can look at reality from two different ways. Reality, to put it crudely, has two different uh, divisions, okay? And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. There's one, a, a division here called, which I'm going to call Div 2, short for Division 2, and that is Ordinary Empirical Mental Experience. In other words, all this stuff up here. Everything from here up, where the physics does not include the true Buddhist atoms, electrons and so forth. Because those are, as far as I know, not empirical. They're indirectly empirical. We, nobody's ever seen a quark, seen an electron, except people that are familiar with uh, Buddhist mindfulness meditation. Okay, so when a physicist sees a, uh, a Buddhist atom, in the lab, they are seeing uh, the computer's representation of what the computer interprets is going on in the lab. Okay, so actually, I have another film of that. Uh, also, I can't believe I forgot. Uh, here's what. Uh, well, here's another film of Buddhist Atoms, but I don't think that I need to worry about that one. Let me. Uh, sorry, I forgot about this one. Here's. Uh, as far as I understand, there you go. That's what physicists see. You know, I mean, one example in the lab. Flashes of light, uh, largely motionless, uh, and there's a lot that physicists have to do to interpret exactly what is going on, that these are particles and so forth seen in the accelerator uh, uh, experimentation that they do in their labs. So, uh, maybe I want to get back to that film. Yeah, here we go in case I need it later. Okay, so 
We're saying then that consciousness constructs uh, biology. This moment here is largely constructed by consciousness. As well, I'll argue this point as I have elsewhere, but we'll argue this in some mild form here today. So the other uh, uh, division of reality, I'm going to call Div 1, short for Division 1, is just the Buddhist atoms, which are immaterial. That could surprise some people that I put that up there. Point particles. So I'm adding some things to the idea of Buddhist atomism here that I haven't brought up yet. Uh, the Buddhist atoms are non-physical. Immaterial, immaterial is a better word. And they are points. A point means it doesn't have any size. If something is point size, it has no size. Yeah? This is like a, like a sort of string thing that you describe. Um, strings do have a one-dimensional or two-dimensional size in string theory. Yeah, I've actually argued in an article coming out later this year in a journal called Axiom Matthews that string theory, uh, to have these irreducible strings, is that there's some problems that need to be sorted out with that, as I, as I think string theorists will admit. But the point particle, now a, a string doesn't have, as far as I know, doesn't have a surface, because it's a one-dimensional line. So a one-dimensional line doesn't have any thickness, if you look at it from the side, or look at its end cap. And so you can't see anything, but it does have size, so no surface, but it has a size. Um, so this would be different though, this is just uh, not even one dimensional, this is zero dimensional, zero dimensional point. And this is, like I've said, this is not, I'm not just giving you great sounding opinions from the 700 AD today. This is stuff that's thoroughly argued for elsewhere. Sorry? It's like quantum, like electrodynamics. Yep. It's, ex it's exactly like quantum chromodynamics, quantum electric. You know, when you've got, um, you don't have continuous fields stretching between particles. You've got particle exchanges of point particles. So unconnected, unattached streams of particles. That's fundamental to why Buddhist atomism and uh, quantum reality are indistinguishable. And you mentioned the word in the introduction, things are connected. I've got something to say about that also. Because I just said unattached. But we need, I need, I'll clarify about that in a little, a little bit. Okay, so one thing that I'm not going to go into today, uh, well, the reason why is because nobody really knows, understands this. These two, these are two ways of looking at one thing. Okay, um, if you look at an elephant, to use a, a, a something that's often, an example that's often used in India. If you look at an elephant, if blindfolded men look at an elephant, or, or sorry, touch an elephant, one will touch the trunk and another will touch the leg, and they're describing the same thing in vastly different ways. Um, that's essentially what's going on right here. These two, really there's only one round boat. As far as I know, no Buddhist has ever figured out, no quantum physicist has ever figured out how uh, these two realms can be identical. This is like, to say that means the following. It means that you are identical to all Buddhist atoms that construct reality now. And if you don't know it, that's fine. That's just your problem. Uh, it doesn't mean that it's not true. It just means that you don't see this. And if you just merely practiced mindfulness meditation, perhaps you would. Uh, as far as I understand, though, how um, they, these can be identical is a mystery. It's actually something I'm working on right now in my in other research. Uh, but I, so I won't go into that in detail. But you should remember that I'm going to discuss these as separate, all throughout you know whatever time we have left. But you should remember that really they're not separate. I'm just discussing them separately because we don't have like the grand unified theory of quantum Buddhism, which is needed. Uh, that, that theory would be. To explain thoroughly number two, which is what I'm going to do, I hope, in an article next year, um, which is nearing completion, and then show how two, two is one. So in other words, to show how division one is div two. Okay.